Open your Bibles to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. I'm really hoping that most of you folks have already either here in person or online or maybe getting the video have watched the last two messages from John 7 and John 9. If you have not, please, after the service, I hope that you will go and get those two messages and take them home and watch them uh, or go online and watch the archive Uh, videos there but that will really help you to get the entire context of what we're talking about here in these three messages the battle between the Lord Jesus and the Pharisees was ongoing throughout his entire public ministry from the time that he began teaching and preaching and healing the Pharisees became his most ardent enemies. They never let up in their pursuit of him. They sought opportunity after opportunity to kill him. Eventually, in the timing and providence of God, the Lord was allowed to be taken by the Pharisees and the civil magistrates which they controlled And of course, he did go to the cross, but he did not go at the hands of the Pharisees. He went at the hands of the Holy Spirit, bound as the Son of God to take away the sins of the world through his sacrifice and his blood on the cross. The Pharisees didn't understand that. They didn't even comprehend any of that. They didn't believe him to be the Messiah, or if they did, they rejected him as such. The animosity, the hatred uh, against Christ was uh, unbelievably strong in the hearts of the Pharisees. If you remember last Sunday, we talked about the, the example of how the Pharisees tried to take him during the miracles that he performed. We looked at the message that he gave to them in John chapter 6, where he said to the Pharisees, You are of your father, the devil and the lusts of your father ye shall do. Jesus minced no words when it came to his reprehension and his rejection of the Pharisees. And I want to tell you something. Jesus hates Phariseeism as much today as he did 2,000 years ago. Can I get an amen on that? Don't think for one second that he has changed his perspective or his opinion The Bible says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he hated the doctrines and the attitudes of the Pharisees, then he still hates those same doctrines and those same attitudes today. And the battle between Christ and the Pharisees continues to this present hour. Looking back just for a second to give you the context again, John chapter 10. John chapter 10, look at verse 19. There was a division, therefore again, among the Jews for these sayings. Every time Jesus opened his mouth, well, just about, the scripture will say, and there was a division because of him. Jesus spoke, and there was a division because of him. And he spoke again, and there was again a division over him. And then he spoke again, and guess what? There was a division over him. This went on and on and on throughout his entire public ministry. Look at verse 31 of John chapter 10. By the way, John chapter 10 is a tremendous chapter, but I've, I've preached through this chapter before 
Uh, I've talked about the shepherds and the hireling. If you haven't got that one, that's on the table as well. The message from John 10 on the true shepherd and the hirelings, all of that is covered in this chapter. But look at verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again, notice again, to stone him. Then again, the Jews took up stones against him. Look at verse 39. Therefore, they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand. The Bible doesn't tell us how he escaped. Whether, or did God perform a miraculous escape or, or not? We aren't told. But what we are told is that the Pharisees again tried to kill him. They tried to seize him, arrest him, execute him. They tried to stone him, and he was spared out of their hands again. All right? So all of that is taking place in John chapter 10 as Jesus is speaking about he is the shepherd. And the, the sheep know his voice, and they follow him, and all these things that you read about in that chapter. Now we go to chapter 11. All of that just happened. Chapter 11 now picks up the story. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Wow. He whom thou lovest is sick. Mary and Martha knew how much Jesus loved their family. They spent time together. They fellowshiped together. He whom thou lovest is sick. You that are his children, you that are bought with the price of his blood, you that have received him as Savior and Lord and have become the sons and the daughters of God, he loves you. He loves you. The Lord loves you. Don't think for one minute that he doesn't love you. Whatever trial, whatever difficulty, whatever heartache you are going through, the Lord loves you. Lazarus had just died. He whom thou lovest. You may think whenever you're going through a trial, you may think when that you are in the clutches of suffering and heartache and rejection, maybe ridicule, animosity. You may tempted to say, how can God love me? He whom thou lovest is dead. He whom thou lovest is sick. He whom thou lovest is going through a trial. He whom thou lovest is going through the adversity. Never forget the Lord loves his people. Amen. Never forget it. Don't let the devil put the doubt in your mind concerning the love of God. He whom thou lovest. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Again, another rare reference to himself as the Son of God. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Again, we see the words, and he loved them. He loved Martha. He loved Mary. He loved Lazarus. The love of God. 
My dad used to tell me growing up, and I've told you this story before, he would say, son, if you in your entire life have one person that truly, truly, truly loves you, you are a rich man. So many people in the world will go through their entire lives. They will live to be elderly. They will die at old age. They will accomplish many things. They will buy and sell. They will achieve and obtain. And yet so many will never, ever experience true love. But no matter whether you find love in a man or a woman or a friend, you that know the Lord, you have one who loves you. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. He delayed visiting Lazarus. He purposely delayed going to see Lazarus in his sick condition. Then after that, he saith to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Again, being mindful of the things that we've brought out over the last couple of weeks, the intensity of the desire of the Pharisees to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. They remind him of this. Are you going to go back to Judea again? That's where the Jews are in power. That's where they have authority of law and government over us. And they want to kill you. Are you going to go back to Judea again and risk your life? Jesus answered, verse 9, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night... He stumbleth because there is no light in him. These things said he. And after he saith to them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. If it, why are we, the Lord's disciples, so dense sometimes? I mean, they, they so often the Lord would tell them something and, and they would just not get it at all. If he's sleeping, he's going to be fine. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. I was glad I was not there. I was glad I did not intervene. This death, this sorrow is going to redound to the glory of God. You don't see the end of this story. You just see what's in front of you. I, the Lord God, see the end from the beginning. I can tell you this man's death is going to glorify God and I'm going to show you something that you've never seen before. Let's go. Verse 16. Then said Thomas, good old Thomas, which is called Didymus. Didymus means twin. Thomas was a twin. Doubters, skeptics, always have twins. <laughs> they never come one at a time. They come in bunches. They're like bananas. There are always several of them. 
He's a twin. All right. Let's go also that we may die with him. Well, don't you love being around guys like that? All right. It's all over. We might as well just go ahead and get it over with. Let's just all go die now. You got to be careful about getting too friendly with people like that. Because that negativity is contagious. It's like a disease. You get around these guys, I mean, you can be feeling good, and, and man, you got faith, and you got victory in your heart, you got power in your soul, and you get around these guys for about five minutes, and oh, man, it's all over. Oh, I feel awful. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. That's Thomas. Well, the Lord had one in his and his disciples, uh, we, we're going to have them too. Let's go. We're all going to die. It's all over. Then when Jesus came, he found that he was laying in the grave four days already. Four days. Now Bethany was nigh to Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs. That's about two miles. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. What was Martha's problem? Martha's problem was the same problem that a lot of us have. She was limiting God to a place. You were over there in, in Galilee. If you had been here, he, not, he would not have died. Wait a minute, Martha. You remember the centurion whose servant was deathly sick? And Jesus was on his way to his house. And the centurion sent a servant to the Lord and said, Lord, it's not necessary for you to come to my house. Just say the word and my servant shall live. Jesus could have said the word from where he was and Lazarus would have been healed. Martha was limiting him to a place. She was limiting him to a place. Let me tell you something, folks. Our God inhabits the universe. The Lord was waiting on us before we came to the place he called us. He hasn't caught up with us. He was already there. He's in front of us. The place is irrelevant. God can do what he wills where he wills. God can do, God can help to change the course of liberty for America from the Flathead Valley of Montana as well as he can from any place else in this country. <laughs> that at one point in time he chose Boston. That at one point in time he chose Philadelphia. That at one point in time he chose New York. That at one, time, one point in time he chose the wilderness of Kentucky and Tennessee. That at one point in time he chose the western expansion of the Lord's people. At, that at one point in time he chose this place or that. God can choose any place he so desires to do his 
will. He is not limited to place. That's how it's been here. Jesus said, thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Oh, I know he's going to be resurrected in the last day sometime later on. Who knows when in the eons of the future? Martha! You're looking at the resurrection. I am the resurrection. Notice, I love that verse, he shall never die. Do you know that a Christian never dies? Never dies. At the moment of physical death, the soul of the believer is taken into heaven by the angels. The Christian never dies, never experiences death. The body dies, but the soul of the believer is taken from that body body of death and you the Christian never loses life not for a second not for a second I think I've told you this about my dad you probably get tired of hearing me talk about the stories of my dad before it's over my dad used to say I'll never forget it Chuck one of these days you're going to hear that I'm dead. He said, son, don't you believe it. I haven't died. I've just changed addresses. <laughs> Dad's got a new address. Dad's more alive than ever. When you face that moment of physical death, in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Boom. My, not, my wife and I were present when my mother went to heaven. We were at her, beth, at, at her deathbed. We were by her side when she breathed her last breath and slipped into eternity. There is no question in my mind that at that moment when that last breath was taken the angels of heaven were in that room and took the soul of my mother to heaven and she never one time experienced death and thank God the body that she will have in heaven will not be the sick diseased body that she left this earth in He that believeth in me shall never die. You believe this, Martha? She saith him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for me, for thee. Oh, listen, child of God, listen. The Master is calling for you, too. The master is calling for you. You don't need to be back in the shadows, sorrowing, fearful, depressed, discouraged. There's something the Lord has for you to do. There's something the Lord has for you to see. You have much to live for. God wants to do something in your life. Get out of the shadows. Come into the sunlight. Hold up your head. You're feeling sad. You're feeling mournful. But the Lord is here. And he's calling you. Are you listening? 
Are you listening? God is calling each of us. We each have a task. We each have a responsibility, a duty, a privilege of being the Lord's servant where he has placed us in the task he has given us. Get out of the shadows. Come into the light. The master calleth for thee. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. I hope you do that. Don't ever run away from the Lord. Don't turn your back on him. You come quickly when he calls you. How privileged we are when the Lord seeks us. Now, Jesus was not yet coming to the town, but it was in the place that Martha met him. The Jews, which were with her in the house, comforted her when they saw Mary. They rose up hastily and went, or goeth, and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth into the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto the Lord, If thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Same problem. Same problem. She limited God to a place. Not only that, she limited God to a time. Two days he delayed. Four days he's now dead. If you had come earlier... He had not died. Not only did these dear ladies limit God to a place, they limited God to a time. Hear me. Do I thank God for what the Lord did with George Washington and Patrick Henry and Samuel Adams and Jonas Clark and those men at the Church of Lexington who stood on Lexington Green at 4 o'clock in the morning on April 19, 1775. Do we thank God for them? Do we Thank God for their time, the time that they lived. Yes, absolutely. What a great time it was for the Lord's people. What a great time it was for liberty-loving patriots. What a great time it was in the history of mankind. What a great time it was. I hear my patriot brothers so many times say, well, there just aren't any George Washingtons today. There just aren't any Patrick Henrys today. There just aren't any Sam Adams today. There aren't any Jonas Clarks today. They, they, they think that God is limited to the time of 200 plus years ago. Let me tell you something. We still have in America today the same blood flowing through the veins of great patriot men and women in America today as much as was in 1775 and 1776. Granted, it's a larger population. Granted, we may not notice them in the numbers that we did 200 years ago. Granted, we may not see them gravitating to one smaller location within this vast country that we call the United States of America. Give you that. That is true. But don't think for one minute that the blood of patriots is not still flowing in the hearts 
of brave men and women today in this country. And you and I do not know that God may have another resurrection planned for us just as he did for our patriot forebears over 200 years ago. If Jesus can raise Lazarus from the dead with the word of his mouth, he can raise this country from the dead by the word of his mouth. And when the Lord gets ready to do whatever it is God wants to do, I am convinced that there are still tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, yea, millions of us who are already willing and anxious to answer his call. Don't think for one minute that God is bound by a place or time. Oh, it's been four days. He's already dead. It's long gone. You're too late. <laughs> Jesus therefore saw her weeping. And the Jews also weeping which came with her. He groaned in the spirit. And was troubled and said. Where have you laid him? He said. Lord, come and see. Next verse is the shortest verse in all the Bible. Jesus wept. We don't have a high priest that's not touched with our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we, yet without sin. He knows the groanings of our heart. He knows the desires of our heart. He sees our heart. He feels our heart. He sees our tears. He weeps with us. He groans in his spirit when we groan. He's touched with compassion. He saw their tears and he wept. I think the Lord sees my tears when I weep. I think he sees my heart breaking. I believe he knows the desires. He's going to perform his will in his time. You cannot rush God. You cannot command God. You cannot demand of God. He will do in his time what he will do. But he sees our hearts. He sees our sorrow. He sees our grief. And he grieves with us, cries with us, sorrows with us. And his will will be done. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him, Lazarus. How he loved him. Oh, how much does the Lord love us? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How much does the Lord love us? He loved us so much, he went to the cross of Calvary and died for our sins. That's how much he loves us. That's how much. Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that this man should not have died? Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. He wasn't taking away the stone so that it was necessary in order to raise him. He was taking out away the stone so that when he was raised, he'd be able to walk out or actually hop out. He didn't walk out. He was bound in grave clothes. He hopped out. Take away the stone. Hey, look. 
take away the stones from your life, the things that are preventing, the things that are getting in the way of you doing what God wants you to get rid of those things. All kind of impediments that sometimes we hold on to that keep us from doing what God would have us to take away the stone. Get rid of that, that rock. This man's going to come out of that grave in a minute. Take away the impediment. Take away the hindrance. What's hindering you from getting out of that grave you're in? What is it? What is hindering you? Get rid of it. Take away the stone. Get ready to come out of that grave. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, <laughs> Lord, by this time he stinketh. <laughs> He's been dead four days. <laughs> Boy, that's a positive attitude, isn't it? <laughs> Lord, do you realize what you're saying when you say remove the stone? He stinketh. I love the King, I love the King James. <laughs> he stinketh. So the next time you sit next to somebody that won't take a bath, you can say, you stinketh. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, if you always follow, no matter what it is, if you always follow it up with, bless your heart. You can get by with anything. So I'm just, I'm just trying to help you here. You stinketh. Bless your heart. <laughs> of course, that's none of you folks. I understand. He stinketh. He's been dead for days. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? They, they still don't understand. Up to the last minute, they don't get it. They don't understand what the Lord is about to do. They, they, they're not even sensing what's about to happen. We're so much like that. I mean, up until the very moment that God does something miraculous for us, we, we're, we're completely oblivious to it. We don't see it. I mean, it's right in front of our very eyes what the Lord is getting ready to do, and we don't see it. I, I truly, truly believe God is getting ready to do something miraculous in this country. I truly believe that. I don't know what that means. I don't know what it entails. But I believe God is going to do something miraculous for his people in this place. I truly believe that. I'm not discouraged. I'm not depressed. I'm not despondent. I look to the future with faith. I believe that God is going. The signs are there. How many how many letters and emails have I read? How many do I need to read? And these are just a fraction of the numbers that we get. Just me. This is just me. The letters that come to me. This is not the ones that are going off all over the country with others that are in the same fight. Just right here, this one little fellowship, this one pastor, Look at the thousands of people that are crying out. I'm looking for a church that'll preach the truth. I'm looking for a pastor that'll preach the truth. I want a church that's not muzzled by the IRS. I want a church that's not encumbered by the 501c3. I want to go to a place where the word of God is taught without fear or favor or compromise. Do you not know that that is God stirring the hearts of his people, getting them ready for a miracle? Yeah. 
Why are people moving to the Flathead Valley? Why are people willing to turn their backs on jobs and land and family and all of the things they've known for their entire lives? Completely uproot themselves and go to a place they've never lived before. Go to a place that they've never seen before. How can that be? Ladies and gentlemen, this is not normal. This is not average. No, it's not normal. This is extraordinary. This is God working in the hearts of people to do something they would never have done on their own. God has shown them. They know there are difficult times coming. They know there is adversity coming. They know there are challenges. They're beginning to understand what the priorities in life are. And the priorities in life are not how many national brand restaurants do you have in your town. The priority is not how many amusement parks are in the town. How many, uh, how many uh, places of recreation are in the town. That's not the priority. And tell you something else, not the priority. How much money I make is not the priority either. There are people here in the valley that left high paying jobs, secure jobs, well off with nice homes, beautiful cars, and they walked away from it. They came to a place where they might make half as much as they were making. Live in a house that's half the size of what they used to live in. But there was something here that to them was more important than a house and a paycheck. Just, I know there are, there are places around the country where there are Congregations of freedom-minded people, believe me, I know that I've traveled over a quarter of a million miles across the continental United States the last few years. I've been to all four, I've been to all 50 states except four. I've seen patriot Christian people all over America. Truly, they are there. I've seen them, met them. Wonderful, good people. But I can tell you, in my personal experience, I have never found a place where there are more freedom-oriented, patriot-minded, sacrificial men and women of conviction and courage for the things of liberty than I have found here in the Flathead Valley of Montana. Amen. If there is a place with more of us in congregation, I don't know where it is. This valley is filled with liberty-loving people. I was talking to I talked to members of law enforcement quite often. I have friends at every level of law enforcement. I was talking to one of these, and he's not from around here, and, he, and he's in, he's in a, a federal office. And we were talking about the burgeoning police state that's taking place in front of our very eyes. And as in the midst of the discussion, I, I said to him, there's no question that everything we've talked about here today is true. There is a burgeoning police state. There is a devilish, tyrannical effort to subject the American citizenry into a giant police state. There's no question that effort is underway. But then I told him with all the sincerity that I knew 
I said, you got to understand something. I don't care what they do. I don't care how much tyranny they inflict on this country. I don't care how much power and police force presence they may choose to try and present to the people of this country in order to subjugate them to a police state. It will not happen in the Flathead Valley of Montana. I told you, it won't happen. No more than whenever Adolf Hitler was marching through Europe and the entire continent was under the jackboot of Nazism and they came to the border of Switzerland and they had their war conference about what were they going to do about the Swiss. And they all agreed that the Nazi machine had the power, the man, the man, the machine to overrun the country of Switzerland. They all said, we can do it. And then they all said, but it's not worth the price. Amen. And while the world was at war in World War II, Switzerland lived their lives without the first sign of war. They were all living in peace and joy throughout the entire war. The little old nation of Switzerland. Why was that? Because every man, woman, and boy and girl of any age knew how to use a gun, had a gun, and was willing to use a gun. During that period of time, they, uh, the story is told famously now of whenever some people say they came to a Swiss citizen and they said, the, the, the Germans are on your border. The, the Nazis have amassed on your borders. You're surrounded. All of Europe has already fallen. They, they are number you at least four to one. What do you think you can do against that? And the Swiss citizen said, well, I guess I'll have to shoot my rifle four times. <laughs> That's what you'd have to do here in the valley. And I don't think the Flathead is the only place where that's true. I think most of Montana's that way. I think much of Idaho's that way. I think much of, of Wyoming is that way. I think there's a lot of regions around where that, you, the only way you could subjugate that group of people into tyranny is you'd have to kill every man, woman, and child. Because you cannot enslave someone who is not willing to be enslaved. You can kill them, but you can't enslave them. And my federal police officer friend said, he paused for just a moment and he said, I believe you're right. God is doing something. The signs are everywhere. Yeah, the enemy is doing what they're doing, sure, of course. Lazarus was dead. The enemy conquered him. He, he was dead. But the Lord was getting ready to do something miraculous. They didn't see it. And I'm trying to say to you, the Lord is getting ready to do something miraculous for our people in America today, our freedom-loving, God-fearing people in America today. God is preparing. Open your eyes. Look into the future with faith. God is doing something in this country today. It's not over. And they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. I'm not 
praying this for me. I'm praying this for them. I know. I know you always hear me. You always answer me. You always are with me. But I want them to know. I want them to know. And when he had thus said, spoken, he cried. I like this. He cried with a loud voice. He cried with a loud voice. Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound head to foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And can you just see him? He's bound head to toe. His face is, is encased in grave clothes. Lazarus, come forth. He sits up and he comes out of that grave. And the Lord said, and I love this part, and the Lord said, loose him and let him go. Take off those grave clothes and let him go. Oh, wow. I think that's what the Lord is trying to say to his people today, too. That's what he's trying to say to the church. That's what he's trying to say to these pharisaical pastors. That's what he's trying to say to the IRS and the 501c3. That's what he's trying to say to the government. That's what he's trying to say to all these would-be tyrants. Loose them and let them go! Loose the church and let it go! Loose my people and let them go. What did Moses say to Pharaoh? Let my, say it, let my people go. Loose him. Let him go. Man, they're bound in grave clothes. You're bound with tradition. You're bound with rules, man-made rules, man-made regulations. You're bound with all these denominational restrictions and, and all these denominational uh, things that have no basis in Scripture whatsoever. You're bound by it. There's no freedom in your heart, no freedom in your soul. There's no freedom in your life. You're a slave to the traditions of men. Loose him and let him go. Amen. You know, if Jesus had not said, Lazarus, come forth. If he had just said, come forth. Every dead body in that cemetery would have got out of the grave and walked away. Amen? Amen. Lazarus, come forth. When God calls us to life, eternal life, he calls us, hold on to this, individually. individually you could be here in a in this great audience but when the lord calls you to life he didn't call the whole group he calls you by name joe come to me mary come to me Robert, come to me. Sally, come to me. He calls us individually, individually. And we must respond individually. Doesn't matter that your mom and dad are Christians. Doesn't matter that you were raised in church. Doesn't matter that your uncle was a Methodist circuit riding preacher or your grandmother taught Sunday school in the Presbyterian church. When the Lord calls you, he calls you by name. He calls you individually. Follow me. Come to me by name. 
And when the Lord calls you, if you're here today without Christ as Savior, and at the conclusion of this message, whenever the invitation is given for you to receive the Lord as your Savior, he's going to call you by name individually. Come to me in your heart. You. I'm talking to you. I remember when the Lord called me. Boy, it didn't matter what the rest of the crowd thought about it. It didn't matter what the rest of the crowd did or didn't do. I knew the Lord was calling me. Lazarus, come forth. We're almost done, but the best part is still this to come. Verse 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus had done. All right, now follow me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this thing kind of suddenly. But you got to get this. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council <laughs> and said, What do we do? This man doeth many miracles. What are we going to do? I bet this verse, you've probably read it a hundred times and you didn't ever really see it. Watch this. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. If we don't stop this man, the whole nation will believe on him and the Romans will come and take away our place and our political authority within the nation. If we don't do something, we are going to lose our power, our position, our authority in the nation. Holy cow. Now we're getting down to the real reason they hated Jesus. It wasn't about the people. It wasn't about liberty. It wasn't about the blessing of heaven. It wasn't about the fulfillment of of the Old Testament prophecies. It was about them keeping their position, their power, their money, their influence, and their authority. Are you getting this? You wonder why some of these pharisaical preachers that stand in front of these so-called churches and they reject the message of truth and they reject the message of liberty. They reject the authority of the Lord God over the affairs of men, and that includes the affairs of state. And they refuse. They refuse to believe. They refuse to accept. Why? So that they might maintain their position, their power, their wealth, their money, their retirement programs, their insurance benefits, their notoriety in the community, in the ministeriums, in the denominations, and with Caesar. Did you get that? 
Rome, Rome will come and do this. The government, the government will take away our benefits. A long time ago, these would-be tyrants in Washington, D.C., came to realize that the best way to accomplish, to accomplish their goals was not as much through intimidation, although they have become masterful at that as well, but more so through bribery. Over 100 million U.S. citizens over 100 million U.S. citizens are today on some form of welfare. 100 million plus. The numbers of churches that are receiving faith-based initiative monies started under G.W. Bush, continuing to the present time, grow exponentially by the day. Many of these ministries that you see these churches have, including sometimes food banks, including sometimes child care centers, and sometimes, uh, sometimes schools, sometimes uh, so-called missionary outreaches, etc. Many of those are funded by the taxpayers of the United States via faith-based initiative federal programs. And the larger the church, typically, the more federal contributions go into those ministries. Many of the building programs that the larger churches are conducting today have government-funded sources in those building programs. Many of the jets, the private jets that some of these televangelists are flying all over the world in were supplied by governments and some of those governments, if not most of those governments, were governments foreign to the United States of America. Foreign governments purchasing the private jets of the televangelists who are going across America fleecing the country's Christians and facilitating global war all in the name of Christianity financed by foreign governments. And if you think I'm exaggerating or if you think I'm making it up, think what you will. I'm telling you the truth. If we don't stop this man, we're going to lose everything. Our money, our position, our power, our authority, everything. Jesus was threatening the power structure that existed between the Roman government and the Pharisees. And that same whorish marriage that took place between the government of Rome and the Pharisees of Israel is still taking place today between the government and those religious whores that have sold their souls to the riches of what Rome, the government, 
can do for them and prostituted the message of the living God in order to accommodate their own success and power and wealth. Some of these men, I'm telling you, some of these men live like kings. They have mansions all over the world. They live a luxurious lifestyle that only the richest and most powerful of the world's men could ever live. The Pharisees were prostitutes for power and wealth. And many of the religious leaders in America are prostitutes for power and wealth. That's why they're not going to take a stand. That's why they're not going to say anything about the truth. That's why they're not going to make a peep. That's why they're not going to resist in any form or fashion. They have too much personal interest in the success of the power of the state. And you listen to this. If the day comes that the powers that be declare some form of martial law and demand that the American citizenry surrender their firearms, First, in the first place, I know we have. They are watching us. I know that. Amen. So to you, they, them, those, you know who you are. I want to just say to you now, when you declare martial law and demand that the American citizen surrender his firearm. All I'm telling you, that, sir, is an exercise in futility in the Flathead Valley of Montana. Just <laughs> but when they do, mark my words, the vast majority of the pastors Pick the denomination. I don't care. Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Assembly of God, you name it. The vast majority of them would get up in their pulpits the very next Sunday and they would encourage their congregations to submit to that government dictation. They would. They would. You know they would. Why? Why would they do this? Verse 48. If we don't do something, the Romans are going to come and take away our place. Here's, here's the tragic part of that. So they sided with government. They rejected Christ eventually in compliance with Rome, arrested him, scourged him, beat him, and took him up to a hill and crucified him. They did that to save their position, their power, their temple, their authority. About 35 years later, the date 70 AD, guess what 
happened. The Romans came to Jerusalem and destroyed their place, their position, their power, their temple, and everything they had. And the Pharisees, as a power, as an authority institution, ceased to exist, wiped out of the face of the earth. Romans did it. If we don't kill this man, the Romans are going to come and take our place. And they crucified him to save their reputations and their wealth they had with Rome. And Rome, a few years later, most of these men would have still been alive when the Romans came and took everything they had. These preachers who think they can sleep in the beds the whorish beds of the state and themselves not have taken from them what they're trying to hold on to are delusional. The tyrannical state doesn't care who you are. They respect not what you have done. They only care about their own power. And when the moment came for Rome to make a decision about what are they going to do about these Pharisees and these Jews and the city of Jerusalem, and Jesus predicted all of it in Matthew 24. You folks that keep thinking that Matthew 24 is all about the end times and the coming of Christ in the last days, it's not. It's about the destruction of Jerusalem. In 70 AD, Jesus told us what was going to happen. He told them what was going to happen in Matthew chapter 24. And everything that Jesus said happened just like he said it. And those Pharisees lost everything. I think there's a word for that. It's called poetic justice. Aren't you glad? No matter what the trial and what the suffering and what the heartbreak might be in the meantime, aren't you glad you're a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ and not a slave to the state? Let's stand for prayer.